Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's session on AI. Well, AI is taking over the world, but uh, yeah, let's find out what we're going to see about it tonight. Um, I'm delighted that everybody's come to join me to talk about this one. I want to start by saying and remind you, I'm a Senko at the end of the day. I'm a teacher. I trained as a teacher. I ended up in Senko role. I love technology. So I've mixed the two together. I am not an AI expert. I am not a technology expert. So I don't know the ins and outs of how this works. I just can see the potential for it. And I don't know about anybody else, but I have had one of those weeks where I kind of just want to go and get in bed and not get out of it for several hours. I've got a thumping headache tonight. So I apologize if I stumble over my words and sound like an absolute and utter idiot. It's no different to any other time, to be fair. OK, Gavin, can you put me slides up for me, please? OK, so AI taking over the world. Um, I want to start by saying that in the 1970s, and I, I am a child of the 1970s, I remember my dad coming home with a little plastic box. Actually, it wasn't that little. It was fairly hefty, actually, probably about an inch thick. And um, being really, really excited because he'd managed to get his hands on a pocket calculator. Uh, prior to that, it was slide rules and all the rest of it, but the pocket calculator became something that we could purchase and use, and it changed things. And I don't think anybody could now actually say, I wish we could go back to using the slide rule. In fact, I don't think I ever learned how to use the slide rule. Like I say, I'm a child of the 70s, but uh, I grew up using calculators. So, um, to me, AI and what we're seeing in the world at the moment is a new version of the pocket calculator. It isn't going to go away. It isn't going to change. We're not going to make it disappear. So we might as well just embrace it and get on with it and use it the best we can for ourselves, for our staff, for our parents and for our students. So I think it has the, that potential to revolutionise the way that we live, the way we work, the way we learn. Um, and I think it can have a really profound impact on, on education, um, the, the way that we actually deliver education. I know that when we had COVID and we, we, we locked the schools down, this is in quote marks, you can't actually see me quite so well on this, but I mean, I'm doing quote marks. We locked the schools down, we went to this online learning model and it, there was all the talk about, well, we've now proven that online learning can work and all the rest of it. And then we went back and we just went back to the old ways of being in the classroom. Um, actually, I think that we learned a lot from that online experience and that it did work for a lot of students that we perhaps didn't expect it to work for. Um, and AI is going to be the same. It's, it's going to help us to do things. So today's session, I want to share with you the basics of AI. I want to introduce you to chat G. PT, because Gavin always gets it the wrong way around. GTP. GPT, Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. So that's where GPT comes from. Um, I want to show you how it can support your role as a SEMCO, the workload of your teachers, and support student access to education. And I will also share some other AI tools that you could explore as well. And believe me, I have found some brilliant ones out there. There are, there are just too many of them. In fact, sitting on my desk, I've got a piece of cardboard because I couldn't find anything to write on the other day. It's absolutely full of suggestions. Anyway, um, email address is on the screen. So if you do need any advice beyond this or you'd like me to send you a list of other things that I've managed to find, I'm more than happy to do that. Just drop me an email. So um, on my screen here, I have got what is AI. And it's got three little bullet points over on the right hand side. Um, this is actually Canva. And uh, if I click my play button, I'm going to let it play while I'm talking. There we go, that'll go. Um, I think most people have now heard of Canva. They use it to generate their infographics, their images. If you've seen us put anything on Facebook, you will have seen that we use Canva. That's what generates our images for us. It's what we use to um, produce the newsletter and the various bits and pieces that go out. Well, within Canva is actually built Magic Write. And you can see I've just given it a prompt and I asked it to write me five tips on how to support dyslexia in the classroom. Um, yeah, OK, I'm playing your recording, but I can promise you that that recording is playing in live time. In other words, I've not um, decided to speed it up or anything like that. It's given me five tips on how to support dyslexia in the classroom like that. 
What's good about that? Okay, well, first of all, I don't know about anybody else. I, I, I have a new diagnosis. I'm going to get it written to the DSM so that I can have it put on an IEP. I have a massive problem with blank pages. I will procrastinate for hours because I've got a blank page. Give me an assignment title. Ask me to do anything. I'll probably say yes to you. But if I've got a blank page and I don't know where to start, I will just sit and stare at it. Now, this, OK, it's not perfect. It's got an American spelling for utilise in there, which irritates me, Ugh, really irritates me. But hey, -ho. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a starting point. And at the end of the day, for anything we want to do in education, most of us will tweak it to our own needs, will make it fit what we need. And that there allows me to start with something. Maybe I only like three of those top tips. OK, fine. I've got three more top tips than I would have had if I just sat there with a blank page. And it only took me a couple of seconds to get that information. So where am I going with that? AI, it stands for artificial intelligence. And it is very much artificial about it. Um, it refers to that development of computer systems that perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence. So things like visual perception, speech recognition, decision making and language translation. In this particular case, it's a language translation is giving me an answer. It has actually been around for decades, and I mean decades, um, but we've had some recent advancements in technology and they've made it more accessible and more powerful than ever before. So ChatGPT, which I'll show you in a few minutes time, the model that we're working with was released in November last year. So three, four months ago, um, and, and it exploded. ChatGPT4 was actually released two days ago. And oh my goodness, the difference between ChatGPT4 and ChatGPT3 blew my mind two days ago. It's probably why I've got a headache, to be fair, because um, it's, it's, it's even better. And I, I can't believe I'm actually saying that. Um, there are several different types of AI or artificial intelligence. We've got what's called machine learning. We've got what's called deep learning and we've got what's called natural language processing. And this particular one is natural language processing. So it's taking how I talk to it and giving it back to me in a way that I can understand. I mean, it's not writing it in code or anything like that, that I'm going to look at and go, yeah, I think I've clear what you're going on about. It actually makes sense to me. Where can I use this then? <clears throat> I can say this is a particular one is built into Canva. So I can go into Magic Write in Canva. I could ask it to do this. As a Senko, I could then copy and paste that, drop it into a um, infographic document or a, an image document. I could create a bookmark perhaps to hand out to my teaching staff with those five top tips. I could put it on a PowerPoint slide. I'll show you another one later that actually does it better than that for PowerPoint, but um, I could use it for that. I could use it in a handbook that I'm creating. I can just use it to prompt my staff. It's just a really quick way of doing things. Okay. So oh, let's start playing my slide again. Let me pop another one on for you. Whilst I'm talking, I'm just going to see it play on the side there. Is it playing? Yes, it is. OK, I just need to move that out of the way. So ChatGPT, this is uh, playing on the left hand side of the screen. I actually haven't got the whole thing up there, um, but it is a language model. It's been developed by OpenAI and it's capable of generating human like responses to questions and requests. You can actually see I've just asked it, what is the role of the Senko in the UK? Um, it's been trained on a massive data set of internet information, book information, human information, and it generates responses that are generally coherent and relevant to the context. Again, there are a couple of caveats with it, which I'll come to a little later on. Uh, we can use it in a variety of ways. We can use it as a virtual tutor. We could use it as a writing assistant. We could use it as a research tool. Um, but it's designed to be easy to use and accessible to everyone. Now, I asked a second question here. Who is responsible for the progress of children with SEN in a UK classroom? I love the answer that it gave because it said, firstly, got to love G chat GPT for this, it is the responsibility of the class teacher. Please note it did not say the Senko first. It said class teacher, then it said other professionals, then it said the Senko, and then it said the parents and carers, which is fair enough because it was actually talking about the classroom. 
So a great answer to that question. Um, and the next one is, is there any legislation Senko should read? And it gives me some ideas. It talks about the law first. It talks about the CAFA. It then talks about the SEND Code of Practice, the Equalities Act, the Education Act, the Mental Capacity Act, the Data Protection Act. You'll notice underneath there's a box that says Regenerate Response. If I don't like that answer, I can get it to write it again for me and generate it a different way. So it might use different language, it might reorder them. I quite like that order, so I'm quite happy with it. If I wanted more information on one of those, I could have typed in, please give me more information on bullet point three, and it would give me more information about the Equalities Act. There is a slight problem in that the data set it has been trained with only goes up to around about December 2019. So if you ask ChatGPT, when did the Queen die? It will laugh at you, literally, it will laugh at you and say, don't be silly, she's still alive, which is actually quite scary. Um, but ChatGPT4, which I say came out two days ago, is actually able to link to more current information. It's got a more current data set that goes with it and it can live trawl the information that's available on the internet. So it's able to pull some of that more modern information, if you like. It's not quite human. It will make mistakes. Sometimes it can try and convince you it is right, even though it has got a wrong answer. You do need to have some uh, knowledge and understanding of what you're asking it in the first place. And that's why I don't think we should be scared of it. It isn't going to take over. It isn't going to rule the world for us. We are still in control of it because it, it does make mistakes. Anyway, why do we want to use it in education? So I've got four reasons up on that top left hand side. The first one, it supports differentiation or adaptive teaching. Um, I will show you a little later on how you can actually use it for that. Um, secondly, it can reduce teacher workload. Uh, thirdly, it can help improve student access to education and enhance student engagement. Before Christmas, I remember posting in the Facebook group about, well, in fact, on Twitter as well, um, a, a group of year four students had gone into a school and there, there was a little bit of a riot going on. Um, they'd been asked to write a letter to Santa and they just did not want to do it. They were not engaged with this at all. And uh, I'd walked in and I sat down and I said, oh, OK, I'm not going to be able to get on with my work that I need to do until this is dealt with. So I pulled them to one side and I said, what have you been asked to do? And they told me, I said, OK. Should we get a computer to do it for us? And they thought I was going to sit there and scribe sentences for them. Well, let's face it, A, I didn't have time for that. And B, they would have lost patience with me waiting for me to do it. I actually loaded up ChatGPT and said, we want to write a letter to Santa about. And it spat out for us within 30 seconds, a framework letter. And these students kind of sat there with their jaws dropping down on the floor and were stunned into silence until one of them hyped up and said, but I don't want to write to Santa, I want to write to Brian Cox. So, okay, fine, what do you want to write to him about? And he, he named some star system I've never heard of. You wouldn't believe I was a scientist, would you? Anyway, he named some star system I'd never heard of. He said, I want to tell him about this star system and I want to ask him what his favourite, whatever it was, was. I said, fine, okay. So we put that into the chat engine. And again, it spat out a framework letter for them and an example letter. and within what three four minutes of me picking those students up from the corridor and sitting down with them they were calm they were engaged they were very very happy because they could now engage with something they could do if i'd have sat with them with a whiteboard and a pen and tried to tease out of them some of those answers you know, how do we start a letter how do we do what do we want to write that takes time and uh I didn't have the time for it and they did they didn't have the patience they needed to come down quickly um, from from the behaviors they were exhibiting and we achieved that using this the other side of that story is we actually copied and pasted what they wrote and put it onto Twitter for Brian Cox tagged him into it and he replied to them so you know I'm looking forward to going back to that school because I think I'm their hero now anyway um on my screen I should have hit the play button while I was talking on the left hand side there, you could you were able to see some prompts. I actually use a, a plugin within ChatGPT called AIPRM and AIPRM lets me program things into it. That makes me sound very technical. I promise you I'm not. Uh, basically, I've already told it who it is, what I want it to behave as. Now, in this particular case, there's a, a, an example I've given it and I've said to it, 
when we paste in some information, I want you to mark it. I want you to tell me if there's any spelling errors, if there's any grammar errors, uh, give me a positive comment and perhaps give me some constructive criticism. And that's what you just saw it do on the left hand side of the screen. So I, I gave it information and it's picked out some spelling errors, grammar errors. It actually chose not to pick up any punctuation errors, which is fine. And it gave a positive comment. I can't actually see my screen. A positive comment and a constructive feedback comment at the bottom. Now, for me, this is peer marking. I've worked with a lot of teenagers who absolutely detest peer marking. I can't blame them. So there can't be anything more demoralising than, you know, your, your peers looking at your own work and criticising it for you with, oh, you've not joined your A up properly or you've spelled such and such wrong. Because let's face it, they're, they're not usually nice to each other. They'll pick up the mistakes, not the, not the nice things. Um, either that or they can't read it at all and they'll just write any comment they want at the bottom. So peer marking by the computer takes away some of that pressure for them. It's a computer. It's not going to be subjective. It's objective, objective. I always get this two the wrong way around. Um, it's not going to be subjective. It's not putting up personality into it, even though it's AI that's doing it. I've got the same example over on the right hand side there. And this time I've actually asked it to correct the language. So to give me a comment and correct it. And it's, it's taken that passage. Uh, so the exam paper stared up at her uh, and it's actually rewritten it uh, correctly and given it a little bit of a minor rewording as well to improve the clarity and the flow. Again, so if we had that prompt for our students, they might be doing their homework, they might be a bit worried about, oh, I'm not sure if I've done it, especially an EAL student or an older student. They could put that text in there. It's still their work. It hasn't massively changed it. All it's done is give them some hints on what they could do to make it better. And then you could copy and paste that and, and give you the, the new version if you like. So uh, it's that 24-7 that access to a teacher, if you like. They, they, they've got that. It's there for them. It increases their engagement. OK, let me... Um, there we go. Move on to that one. So if you haven't already set yourself up with an account, the good news is it is free. I just say that again. It is free. You do not have to pay to use ChatGPT. Occasionally, and I'm, I bet Fiona's on this call and she'll say all the time, but um, occasionally you can't get on the system because there is a bit of overload at the moment. Like I said, it's um, it's the new fidget toy, if you like, the fidget spinners that we had a few years ago or the um, pop bops. Um, Everybody's trying to use it. Sunday afternoon at two o'clock in the afternoon is like, Ugh, no, don't even bother trying. Um, it has got better over the last few weeks. They've increased it. Microsoft have invested a lot of money into them. So they've increased their server width. So it is much better. It actually works even better if you use it as a plugin within some of the programs I'm going to talk about. So if you try to use it within Canva or Notion, it's more likely to be able to access it than it is if you're going straight to ChatGPT. But anyway, I'm talking about ChatGPT, but that's not where you go to start with. To start it up, you need to go to Open. AI. So OpenAI are the developers. Um, you create an account there. So sign up top right hand corner. I did actually go on earlier to do something and they've moved the sign up button. It's now underneath pricing. So click on pricing and then you'll find the sign up button in the top right hand corner. Don't ask. Um, fill out the required information, verify your email address and then log into that website. Once you're in there, you need to go to the API section. I'm not going to explain what an API is. Just trust me. Just go there and you need to access ChatGPT. Now, my little warning, if you access what's called the playground on OpenAI, you get so many free credits, I think £18 worth of free credits while you're on there. You can do exactly what you do in ChatGPT in the playground, but it will use up those credits. And once they're used up, you have to start paying. However, if you go to ChatGPT from the OpenAI website or you use it within other programs, you don't pay for it. It's a very strange model. I have no idea why I've gone down that business route. Not for me to reason why. It's just for me to tell you. Don't do it either. So don't go to the playground. Once you're in, go to ChatGPT. Um, 
and you will open up ChatGPT, you'll put in what's called the API code, and you will then be able to use ChatGPT on your computer within a browser. Now, on the right hand side of this screen, you can see that I have suggested an add in. So I have suggested you add AI PRM. So use um, Google or Chrome, whatever it's called. Uh, and if you go to add ins, you'll find AI PRM. And that, like I say, lets you program the prompts and that speeds up the process for you. So if you're working with younger children, at the moment I've only really referred to GCSE students. If you're working with juniors though, um, it can be useful to kind of program it with what you want it to do. And they click on that one and then paste their work in or something. I have got my warnings there, be aware of the limitations. So it's factual inaccuracies data set only being there 2019. And if you are working with older students, you might want to use an AI checker. And I'll again, I keep saying I'll come to them later. There are a couple more slides. I will share some AI checkers with you in a moment. Um, you do have to, when you're talking to it, talk like you're asking a colleague to do something, but that that colleague is new uh, to the role and they need some very, very explicit, detailed instructions. You have to state the obvious. I spoke to somebody the other day, they'd asked it to, um, I can't remember what it was, they wanted it to, to do something for possibly neurodiversity week and they'd asked it to um, generate some information for, I think it was year seven. And I said, try putting in the age of the children instead because it doesn't always understand what year seven means or what year 13 means. So if you tell it, children aged 11 to 12 or 11 to 16, it's more likely to come up with the, the right response for you. Um, so yeah, just be really, really explicit. But you learn by trial and error. It's like anything else. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So um, let me hit the play on this one. I won't play the whole of this particular video. It can, it can do something at the bottom of the screen while I'm talking. Um, what can you get it to do? You can get it to answer questions. So, you know, I showed you what is the role of the Senko in the UK and you get an instant, mostly correct response. It does change occasionally. Um, you can get it to help you with your writing. So you could get it to generate a paragraph or two about the benefits of using AI in education. Um, and it will generate that for you. At the moment, I've told it I'm a year five teacher. I'm delivering a series of lessons on volcanoes. What should I include in the scheme of work? So if I'm, I'm a teacher, brand new teacher, ECT perhaps, um, what could my series of lessons look like? And then at the bottom, what you'll see is I keep adding in new bits of information, what I'm asking it to do. Um, what else can we get it to do? We can get it to give personalised tutoring. So we could ask it to give support to a student who's struggling with that subject. Really good prompts are things like, um, please pick out the key words in this text. Um, or you could get it to do, please pick out the key words and provide a definition, which basically creates a set of flashcards for you, uh, which you can then copy and paste and put into something else to, to print them off. Uh, if you're a teacher, get it to generate your lesson plan like I just showed you there. But you can also then get it to generate you a worksheet with some questions on it. Uh, true, false questions or multiple choice questions or a closed passage. And you can get it to generate the answers as well. So it's, it's giving me a short reading passage there about volcanoes. Um, got EAL students, get it to translate the text live on the screen. Students can actually respond to it in their first language as well. So I could actually turn around to this now and say, OK, um, I've got a, a student who speaks French. Please translate this into French. One of my recommendations, though, if you're going to do that, and it's very good at doing this, you give it the text and you say something like, write this text in a way that a five year old could understand and it will regenerate it using more simple language, if you like, um, so in a way that a five-year-old can understand it, then ask it to translate it for an EAL purpose. And the reason for doing that is very often we make the mistake of just throwing the exact text at a, a, a translation engine and saying, translate this into whatever language it is. And we forget that the carrier language, those words that we're using to support it, might not be within that child's vocabulary range. So even though they are 
um, you know, the, the right age, they might not actually know that word. So simplify it first and then put it through the translation engine. You get a much better result. I think here I've just asked it to um, turn it into something a five year old could understand. So instead of volcanoes are giant mountains that erupt and spew out hot ash and molten lava, we have got volcanoes are big mountains that can explode and shoot out hot rocks, rocks and melted lava. So it's, it's simplifying things for me. Um, what else can I do? Program a mark scheme. Oh, this has saved my life so much over the last few weeks. Um, give it a mark scheme or a rubric, as they call it in American, um, and ask it to mark against that mark scheme. I don't think that's taking anything away from us because what it's actually doing is it's giving us the time to not have to read through a whole load of text for something to identify have they managed to tick off certain criteria or whatever. It gives us the chance to then give them quality feedback about something. Um, this one here, I just asked it to translate it into Ukrainian because uh, I know lots of you are struggling with Ukrainian at the moment. So I simplified it into that text for a five-year-old and then I asked it to put it into Ukrainian. Um, and now it's about to generate me some multiple choice questions uh, some true false questions and some closed passage questions about volcanoes. Let's just have a look and see what it does. I'm just going to ask uh, Gavin, who's looking at the other screen, have we got any questions yet, Jay? No, just Flo saying it was her. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought it was Flo with the assembly. So there we go, we've got some multiple choice questions coming up. I think I forgot to get it to tell me the answers for this one. So we're uh, asking me about shield volcanoes, stratovolcanoes, and potential danger. Uh, two false questions and then a closed passage. And then I said, what are the answers? Because I was having a, one of those moments where I couldn't be bothered to work them out. So it gives me the answers to the closed passage. Um, let's see what else it does after that. I can't actually remember what I asked it to do, if I'm honest. I told you I got a headache. It's now started checking it down with rain as well. Um, how could the lesson plan, oh yes, I remember what I've done now, for week one be adjusted to accommodate the needs of <laughs> the students in the class, which include ADHD, autism, and probably dyslexia. What did I type? Da, 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 dyslexia, there you go. <laughs> So all of those teachers that are saying to you, I don't know how to adjust my lesson. Well, actually, it'll do it for them. So we've, it generated a lesson plan for us. It generated a closed passage. It generated all those things. And now it's telling me some pretty common sense information. But use some visual aids and it gives me some examples and tells me why. Uh, provide hands on activities. Use simple, clear language. Break the lesson up. Provide opportunities for movement. Uh, consider the individual needs. I've then told it there's a teaching assistant available. How could I use that teaching assistant? Um, because one of the things that really irritates me is uh, as a Senko to provide a teaching assistant. They're, they're very expensive. Not that we pay them very much, but they are very expensive as a resource. We provide one to the classroom, but the teachers don't give them any information about what they want them to do or how they can best support the student that they're working with. So uh, being able to give them some instructions here or even the TA to be able to type this into an iPad and get the instructions about how they could best support in this scenario. Um, it's about to tell me how to get the teaching assistant to work with the student who has ADHD or work with the student who has ADHD. I love the fact it doesn't correct my spelling. That is Grammarly down in the bottom right hand corner, by the way, that was telling me about the mistake. Grammarly has this built in as well. It has some AI tools built into Grammarly and has had for quite a while. If any of you use Khan Academy, it's built into there. Um, if you use Be My Eyes, if, uh, I don't know if any of you are aware of Be My Eyes, it's an app for uh, visually impaired individuals who um basically ask for help and there's something like 500 sorry 5 million volunteers on that app who when somebody asks for help it, it, it rings through on the app and that person will say which one's my blue tie or which one's my green tie or which one goes best with what I'm wearing and you can respond to it well be my eyes has been using the uh, the open AI system and the chat GPT system to improve what's going on. So there we go. We've got some suggestions for how the teaching assistant can work with the student who has ADHD, reminding them that they might need a five minute break or use the visual aids or give them some positive reinforcement. OK, so 
other AI and plugins then. So I keep going on about ChatGPT because that's the one everybody knows about. It's the one you've all heard of, but actually it's built into hundreds of other things. So we have got um, plugins for Word and Excel and your emails. Um, the one that I am currently recommending is called Ghostwriter. I didn't actually write it on here. It's called Ghostwriter. I've been in contact with the developer of that. Uh, I actually told him it wasn't working on my computer and he's gone and sorted it out and, and fixed that. It is a paid plugin but you're paying for a developer's time to sort that. Um, and actually, it's pretty good. It's very, very quick and it does things quite nicely. Um, so you can use that if you're not very good with spreadsheets and you're really never sure what formula to use, especially if you want to calculate your um, um, uh, notional budget. How much money am I getting? Am I getting enough money? What what calculation do I need to do to work out how many hours, etc., or whatever? Uh, use the plugin. It'll work it all out for you. Um, so search engine plugins, I quite like Merlin. Merlin you can put into Chrome um, and it basically summarizes your search. So instead of you actually having to open up the search box of what you've found, it will tell you which one does what. And um, there's another one in there called WordTune. Uh, WordTune, if you have that one open, you open up a YouTube video or you open up a PDF file, it will actually summarize that file for you. If you're doing your Nasenko at the moment, you've got you don't have to read the whole document anymore to find out that it was a waste of time. You could or watch a video to find out it was a waste of time. You could actually just load up WordTune and you get a 50, 100, 150 word summary of what that content actually is. Um, over on the right hand side, of that, I'll come to the bits on the left again in a moment. On the right hand side there, I've got Tome. So Tome allows you to create a slide presentation or a book um, using image creation. So I've only talked about text creation at the moment. You can also create images using AI. And I quite like Tome. Tome has generated images for me for various bits and pieces. Um, and the reason I like it is I don't have to pay for it. It does use credits, but um, I've, I have multiple email addresses and it gives me 500 credits for each email address. So by the time I've whipped around all of them, I've actually got plenty of credits to be able to do anything anyway. Um, so if I want a very specific image for something, I can tell it what I want. And the most important thing for me is that that image doesn't exist anywhere else. It has been generated solely for me and my purposes. If you do want something that just generates images, though, there is Mid Journey. You'll have seen those appearing on social media all the time at the moment, they're kind of like fantasy scenes or you'll see a, a white tiger walking through a lake. You really can't tell the difference between real things and things created in mid-journey. Um, and Dali. Dali is the um, probably the most popular one amongst all of those. Um, Heritage. I will show you Heritage in a couple of minutes time. I actually used Heritage with um, a photograph of my dad. And I, I, put, I won't show you the photo of my dad, but I put the photo of my dad in there and Heritage actually animates the photos. So my dad actually died in 1996. It made my dad blink on the screen and turn his head and look at me. I, I, I nearly swore then, um, but I did nearly wet myself. Uh, it was quite terrifying, to be honest. I did actually cry slightly. Um, but I, I think that's amazing. So students who can't quite engage with history, they're not quite getting there. We have got heritage that you could use to, to engage them with those characters. Can you imagine Queen Victoria turning her head on the screen? It would be amazing. Or... Um, uh, what's the other one? Henry VIII. Anyway, Descript. Descript basically allows you to take your own voice or take a child's voice, perhaps, to uh, give some clips of that voice. You need 10 minutes worth of, of clips of that voice. And then you give it a piece of text and it will get the, the system to read that text in the way that that person talks. So I have a very specific way of talking. I don't think specific is the word I want, but I have a very um, different way of emphasizing things and, and stutters and all the rest of it. But um, it's the way we talk, is the way we emphasize the ends of words and the words that we do emphasize and the way we speed up at certain points and slow down. Well, Descript will actually analyze all of that from that 10 minute snippet that you give it. And it can then apply that to a text. Gavin's ears have perked up at this one because this now means if I make a mistake when I'm saying something on a video, he could feed it through Descript and just get it to reread that bit for him without him getting me to re-record it. Anyway, um, Elicit. Elicit is a, a great one for you, Nesenko. Again, it will summarise research papers for you. It's great for anything like that. 
Um, the ones I've underlined, by the way, are the ones that I really like. Uh, Conquer uh, will write lesson plans. Now, I didn't underline Conquer because I found it quite American. And I, it kind of irritated me a little bit, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, but it will write lesson plans for you. It will create your content for those lessons. I've found one since Conquer, though, that basically you can put the information in and say, I want uh, a series of four lessons. Perhaps you've got a student who's working at home. I want a series of four lessons about how um, plants make their own food. So for that, we've got to learn about the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle. We've got to learn about photosynthesis. We've then got to learn about all the other bits that go with that. Um, and it will actually generate the lesson plans, the content of those lesson plans, and the quizzes that go with that to check the understanding. I must find the name of it for you because I actually thought that one was really, really good. Quillbot. I've been using Quillbot since probably about May last year. So, you know, I said ChatGPT has only been around since about November, but Quillbot's been around for a while and it has got AI built into it. So Quillbot lets you put in a piece of text and tell it that you want it to be more creative or tell it that you need to shorten it writing an essay and you need to um, lose a few words, throw it through Quillbot, that works quite well. Or if you're writing an essay and you need to gain a few words, it will also lengthen it for you as well. Um, so Quillbot's a good one. LogSec is a little bit like using um, something like OneNote, or if any of you use Notion, I've got Notion on there as well. Um, Basically, the uh, ChatGPT is built into LogSec, so you add it as an app. And then when you type the forward slash button, let's say I've just typed a sentence that says um, the Romans invaded Britain and put a full stop. And then I think, oh, actually, I could do with a bit more information there or I need to explain it. I can type a forward slash and it will give me just a snippet of information to pad that out. It's quite a nice way of of uh, expanding information. So again, it can be used for lots of things. Notion is a note-taking kind of system very similar to LogSec, um, but you can also do your planning on that. So you could use it as a to-do list or a, a list of things that you need to achieve. And then some, <laughs> this was the conversation a couple of weeks ago. I use Motion at the moment. And Motion, yes, you do have to pay for it. Works out at about 50 pence a day. Um, but it's a calendar system that I put my to-do list in there. It reads all of my calendars for every company I work for and puts all of that in there. And then it will automatically schedule all of my to-dos for me throughout the day. So if I tell it that, you know, actually I want to finish at five o'clock today, it won't schedule anything after five o'clock. But if I tell it I want to work until nine o'clock, it will, it will shuffle my to-do list round for me and put them in there. And I can set hard deadlines. So I know that I've got to do some things for Monday next week. That's a hard deadline. It's got to be done before then. It will prioritise those for me over the trivial things I would rather do instead. Because let's face it, we'd all rather do the trivial nice things instead. But Motion has actually saved me an incredible amount of time over the last few weeks. Uh, back to my left hand side of the screen, that third bullet point there, uh, GLTR, Hugging Face and Output Detector, they are all AI detectors. So if you are worried about students plagiarising information or stealing the information straight from an AI system, any of those will allow you to identify um, the percentage likelihood that it was written by a human or that it was written by AI. I actually don't go there to find those. I actually go to a website called Gold Penguin, because I can remember that, because um, I love penguins. So I go to a website called Gold Penguin, and there's a really good blog post on there with about six or seven different AI detectors that you could use. And then I just put a note at the bottom of there that you have actually been using this for a while. If you've been using Grammarly, if you've been using PowerPoint Trainer, that one where you listen to your voice on PowerPoint and look at how much you slow down or speed up or use ums and ers and it tells you off reading from the slide. Um, that's all built into PowerPoint already. That is AI. That is what you've been using. Um, and all of the learning technology tools within Microsoft Education packages actually use elements of AI already. Uh, other programs that I didn't kind of put on that slide. So you have got... Um, we were talking about this earlier, there are three that you can use to read legal documents and get it summarised in language that you can understand, because let's face it, none of us understand legal documents. There is Legalised Decoder, there is one called Do Not Pay, and there is one called Introspection with an X. Um, they will all summarise a legal document in language that we can understand. If you need help writing an email, 
you know, maybe we've had one of those parent emails where they're grumbling at us and we're trying to find that nice way of responding but in a firm and authoritative manner um, but that doesn't offend them. Uh, you could use uh, one of these bots to help you write that. So there's Write Sonic, Jasper, uh, AI Writer and Copy AI. They're all pretty good for doing that. You could also use Quillbot or you could just go into ChatGPT and tell it what you want. ChatGPT does it absolutely fine, to be honest. Like I say, you can use Ghostwriter. Ghostwriter, you can build it into any of the Microsoft suite. So you can have it in Word. Excel, PowerPoint, and there is also a version that you can use within Outlook as well. Um, I use Rewind AI. Gavin will probably be terrified at this point. So Rewind AI, actually, um, when I'm doing anything and my computer is turned on, I have given it permission to listen to what's going on around me. And if I uh, suddenly remember that I had a conversation with Gavin this morning about doing something and he's telling me, no, you didn't tell me that, um, I can actually go back to it and go, well, I, I know I was on such and such a document at the time because I generally remember things like that. So if I go back to that document and it will actually play me the recording of what I said to him. It's brilliant. Um, but I've used that quite frequently because I have one of those memories where I could generally remember what I was doing at the time, but not necessarily what I said. I don't know what he's just typed in the chat, but I'm quite scared now. Um, <laughs> um, I will find out later. Uh, but I can go back to it. I can go. I, I know I was in that document there. So if I go back to that, it will tell me. It's been so useful in backtracking conversations. Um, and I imagine that would be useful for some of you as well. Uh, other ones that you can use are uh, Fathom. Otter. Otter will do a transcript for you. Fireflies, uh, Rephrase AI and Sapia Creator, they all kind of do transcripts of information. Um, I've already mentioned WordTune and Merlin. There's one called Genii as well. And then uh, Blue Willow will create images a little bit like Midjourney and Dali. And there's also one called Dream Interpreter, which will interpret your dreams for you. So to kind of bring that to a bit of a summary, I suppose. I've got three or four slides at the end here. Why should a Senko use it? Well, first of all, it can help you writing smart targets or scruffy targets or whatever kind of targets you want, or even gas scale targets. It does actually understand what they are and it will write them for you. Uh, again, with a little bit of a caveat, you need to um, use your professional knowledge to make sure it's correct for that student. Um, it will give you strategies and suggestions. So if you've got a student who comes to you with Fragile X syndrome and you're not really sure what that means, you can ask it and then you can say, well, OK, how do I modify lessons to support that student? Um, it can help you write a tricky letter. It can help you automate email responses. It can help you uh, fill in tedious boxes on paperwork because, uh, you know, local authorities love tedious boxes on paperwork. So let's get uh, AI to do it for us. And like I say, use AI PRM because then you can prompt it with what the form needs. And then you don't actually need to keep telling it, well, what do I write in this box? You just kind of prompt it that once. Um, and then you just copy and paste your answers. Um, you can help it plan your next inset delivery. Just make sure you check the accuracy and make sure it's talking about the right child. <laughs> For teachers then, oh, my slides aren't moving. There we go. For teachers and TAs, they can use it to adapt lessons. They could use it to support students actually in the class. Uh, they can use it to generate questions, modify the text, translation, structure things sequentially. Uh, basically, it does the scaffolding for them. So if you haven't got TA in the classroom, you could use the computer and it does scaffolding for some of those students. Break things down, give some waggles, give some frameworks. Um, it helps them to understand different needs, helps them with their planning. My uh, caution is check for the Americanizations and check for the appropriateness. Uh, so again, it's not taking away our professionalism because we still need to be checking it and making sure it's, it's doing what we're asking it to do. Um, for students, it can support them with their literacy and their numeracy and their general knowledge. No more blank pages for any of us. Um, Self-assessment, peer assessment, uh, generate frameworks. So we're not necessarily generating the content, we can get it to generate the framework for us instead. Revision, translating for parents. And then if they use Tome, they can generate a, a starting point so that they could actually get a little bit of a text with the image. Because I can remember teaching primary school students and, uh, you, you know, you say write a story about this. And the first thing they do is get the crayons out and start drawing a picture. Actually, if they did that via Tome, they would type in one sentence. They'll get eight pages of content on Tome uh, with eight, well, with six images and uh, six pages of content. The other two are to do with introduction pages and a title page. And actually, they've got the framework for the piece of work you've asked them to do. 
So it, it takes away, not takes away the fun, but it, it, it takes away that wasting the time so much on drawing images and colouring them in pretty. Um, and it's a tool to support. So like the calculator, sometimes it can be quicker to do it without. <laughs> My two big hints. Um, imagine it's working with a work colleague who is a little bit deaf needs the instructions repeated several times, is a little bit pedantic and does exactly what you tell them to do, but will not do anything more. Think of it like a slightly senile great aunt. Uh, and if you stick to that kind of way of thinking, you'll get the most out of it. Um, and there's just an example on the screen there of, of telling ChatGPT, in this case, how it needs to behave. So telling it your year four teacher in the UK, that's important, um, who speaks clear and coherent English and then goes through and, and tells it what you actually want it to do and then paste the lesson underneath it. Um, just in terms of how much information you can give it, ChatGPT 3 and 3.5 can handle up to 11,000 words, but that includes its output. So if you paste 11,000 words in, it hasn't got any output to give you. Um, if you only paste in 5,000, it can give you 6,000. Whereas ChatGPT4 has a capacity of 25,000. I think I actually mean characters and not words there, by the way. <laughs> I'm just correct myself. Need Descript. Um, and then on my last slide there, your questions about AI, or would you like me to attempt a live demo? I am actually going to just come off my screen and... Mm -hmm. Yep, it has gone to the right one, I hope, yes, because I want to show you uh, this one. So this is Heritage, and I have input a picture of our youngest son um, when he was very, very young. It is just a picture. Uh, this is actually the original picture. I, I asked it to enhance it. I then asked it to animate that picture, and I just want to show you what actually happens. So that is from a single photo, it can do that. And just because I like to embarrass Gavin occasionally, um, sorry, <laughs> Thank Gavin, you. you're welcome. Um, we can animate Gavin, although his eyes go slightly fuddy on this one. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> And then just finally, one more for the fun of it. This is our third son. Now, he's now 12 years old. And uh, yes, he was eating a biscuit off the floor in front of the washing machine. But uh, this is just a photo, an old photo that I found. It's made his eyes move, his head move. He has just asked me, when did I have blonde hair? But uh, And then he, he gives us a little grin as well and blinks. Which, like I say, it was quite scary when I did it with my dad's photo. So... There you go. I wanted to share that one. Gee, have I got any questions or have I bamboozled everybody? <laughs> I think you've bamboozled them all. Question time, people. <laughs> oh, while he does that, I'm going to see if I can load in the photo. Well, I'm going to merge it so that you've got no chance. Oh, OK. Let's go that way. Yeah, this is your chance to ask questions. <laughs> and you send out a crib screen. A crib, crib sheet? A crib screen. <laughs> a crib screen. A crib screen. <laughs> I could. Right. So if I put my PowerPoint back up again, and if you share my PowerPoint... I'll share it again. Um, is it working now, or is it...? Yeah. Okay. That's the one you actually need. So if you go and um, start with that, that's the information you need to be able to get started in using ChatGPT. And all of your, those screens that I've been sharing where you see the text appearing on the screen, that's probably the best place to start. Like many things in education, um it's a trial and error play with it see what works best for you um i've certainly not had any training on it i have had to sit there and mess about with it to be fair i'm an early adopter i've known about this since november and i've been playing since november so i am a, a little bit ahead of the game um but have a, a good play with that and you'll be there gavin will add a list of all of those programs underneath the video when he puts it on the website all those different ones including my ones that perhaps are on the piece of cardboard I don't, I don't have a question, sorry, I have a statement. Oh, go for it. So, because Abigail now records me as I'm walking behind her <laughs> <laughs> and yep. talking to her... Only just, when I turn it on, to be fair. Just be aware that if you are doing that, you will need to notify people in a public place. 
only if you are intending to share it with others for your own personal purposes it is fine to record i have checked the legalities on that one <laughs> um, but it's, it, it was so useful i was on, i was on a, a call with somebody and they'd asked me a question and i'd answered it and of course because i'm on the call it had recorded my audio and i couldn't actually remember what i'd said to that person and I desperately needed to go back to it. So all I had to do with this particular program, which is Rewind, was to go in and say, um, look for, I asked it to look for this person's name. And it came up with every email, every document and every transcript where I had used this person's name. And I was able to go back and actually find what I had actually said at that time. As a Senko, I have had so many of those conversations where, you know, the teacher walks in and asks you something and you, you give them an answer off the cuff and then think later, what did they say? I can't remember now. Um, I can just see the use for that but as gavin says just be very careful how you are using something like that so chat gpt4 like i say it has um changed so they, they, on the demo they showed it an image of some eggs some flour uh what looked like honey uh and something else and said what meal can i make with this so it had to read the image interpret the image and then actually come up with recipes that you could use to um make with those ingredients which you know okay that doesn't sound like it's very useful to a senko but if you can imagine students who struggle especially our students with autism perhaps who struggle to interpret what is this picture showing me that it's like yes yeah, 2d image i'm not really sure what it's supposed to be saying um it, that could be incredibly useful to them um, the other thing it can do is at the moment there is no live link to the internet so if you're in chat gpt or you're in um, canva and you're using it within there or within notion there is no live link to the internet to get uh, up-to-date information chat gpt4 actually has that functionality for you to be able to not for it to search but for you to be able to give it a more recent link so let's say a news article from yesterday about the budget um, and to paste that in and for it to read the information from that it's not trained on it so it won't be able to use it within any other responses but it can use it directly if you tell it where to look which again i think is incredibly useful um as i said i've i've used it or i'm using it on my apprenticeship program at the moment i have the apprenticeship standards and the criteria programmed into there so every time my apprentices send me a piece of work rather than me spending an hour trying to read six or seven pages i actually paste it through it gives me a report that says which ones they have met or haven't met. It'll even tell me what the sentences are within that document if I want it to do that. And then I can give them quality feedback. So I'd rather spend 30 or 40 minutes writing something or talking to them about that and how they can improve it than spend an hour reading it and then try and find five minutes to scribble something down. So it is, it's made a massive difference for me in, in marking. Um, somebody else was saying the other day, because they came to my Nexus session last week where I gave a really quick overview. I did this in about 10 minutes flat. Um, and they, they sat the next day and they, what did she say she'd done? She'd done three policies, oh. six or seven responses to something. She'd used it to generate some documents for her staff as well. She, she, she was on a roll she with said it. She'd done about a month's worth of work <laughs> in one in day. One day. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay. Um, but like I say, it, it, you have to, I believe you still have to moderate it. It still has to be you. I used it, and I'm not afraid to admit to it. I'm doing my master's degree. I put my master's degree question in there and said to it, how should I answer this? It doesn't give me enough words because I needed 1,500 words and it only gave me about 150. Um, but it gave me that starting point to go, oh, OK. And then I said, oh, are there any researchers in this? And it gave me some suggestions. And I went away and I was actually able to generate something from that. It did give me an answer at one point where I looked at it and thought, you what? <laughs> that don't make sense. So again, I had to use my um the knowledge that i already had to mediate that response and i think that's the difference between um mindlessly just plugging it in mm. and just pulling the content out and shoving it wherever we're going to put it and sitting there and actually using it properly to help us reduce our workload and yeah you know, i keep going back to i think it can massively reduce our workload 
if we use it appropriately and we use it properly. Oh yeah, it's going to massively reduce your workload. Not everybody can type as fast as Abigail can as well. I can't type fast. She, she, types, like, <laughs> she types faster than I can type and I'd spend all day in front of a computer. But you could see the speed that that thing was running it out and then just copy and paste in that and then putting it into a document. It's going to save you loads of time in front of your computer, burning your eyes out. Um, or your brain out. Or your brain out. It? trying to kind of think of what to put on there. And let's face it, how many of us actually get, you know, if I want to do something, I actually need it to be fairly peaceful for me to be able to do it. So he needs to stop singing, the kids need to stop squealing, the dog needs to stop tap, tap dancing around the living room. I just... What? There's nothing wrong with my singing. My <laughs> singing's perfect. Wrong with your my singing. Singing's perfect. I just need it to be quiet so I can concentrate on something. When I was in school, I very rarely got that, which is why I did a lot of my work at home. I very rarely had 30 minutes to sit and respond to something quickly and I, or, or correctly. So it would take me two hours to do something that in theory should only take 30 minutes. But if I had had this that could generate something for me and actually all I'm doing is um, checking it for its accuracy, making sure it's in my voice and making sure that it's appropriate... It might only take me 15 minutes. It, I, and if I'm interrupted in the middle, it could really help with yeah, that. Yeah, and it'll, it'll, work, it'll, it'll benefit your work-life balance, definitely, especially when you're kind of at home trying to kind of go through all these hundreds of things that you're trying oh, to do. yeah. The Senkos don't just work 9 till 5 or 9 till 3, 15. Or four, it's 4, 5, 15, 5, 15 at the moment. <laughs> as it is now. Sorry, people, we've kept you for long enough. Guys, go and have your dinner. Take care. Go and play with ChatGPT. Go and play with AI. Don't get lost down a rabbit, Warren. Um, take a two-week trial out on Motion because it's free and it'll tell you to stop playing with it. Um, go and play with it. Go and go and see what you can do with it. And if you've got questions, come back to us either on Facebook group or on the website or that email address I shared right at the very beginning because I would be more than happy to answer questions uh, about different things. And do have a play with Heritage. Like I say, it's quite scary, but it's uh, fun as well. Yeah, you can say bye. I am going to say bye. I was just checking what you were I was, clicking. I was, I was about to press the E for end. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Take care. See you, everybody.